Atheist Nomads, episode 84, Idaho. At least we've got good fishing. This is our special edition Idaho episode, and it went long. There is an extended edition available to our patrons that goes an additional 23 minutes. If you want access, sign up as a patron at patreon.com slash Atheist Nomads. Uh, I also do need to apologize for my sound quality. I was overcompensating for having a guest here with me and the new hardware and ended up making some mistakes I haven't made in a long time. So my apologies. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 84. We are focusing today on Idaho. It's been in the news quite a bit lately, and considering... One half of our podcast is in Idaho. Um, figured rather than having all these uh, outsiders talking about our business, um, might as well have some Idahoans talking about it. So uh, joining me is, I am Dustin, and joining me as always is Wesley. How's it going, Idahoan? Joining us today is Paul. Hi, Dustin. Good to see you. And for your listeners, I'm Paul Rolig. I'm most active as a member of the Board of Directors of Humanists of Idaho. And I'm also a media contact for the Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason, which is an umbrella group of a number of secular organizations here in southwest Idaho. Yeah, and Paul and I have been uh, working pretty close together uh, over the last few years with that. Um, and uh, I do have to say, Paul, you are a awesome person to work with. Well, thanks, Dustin. I appreciate that. And when you, you go to these uh, legislative bodies and, and speak on our behalf, I always know we're in good hands. Yeah. Thank you. I'll try to keep it up. Uh, I don't know how impressed they are when I get up and tell them (laughs) I'm representing non-religious Idahoans, but at least they know we're out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and looking at some of the latest data, uh, there was a a, a survey that just came out looking at all the recent polling data, and Idaho is actually in one of the 13 least religious states as far as affiliation goes. So do you mean that that it is actually number thirteen? Uh, no, it's it's like ten or eleven. Oh, okay. Uh, pretty high level. Like I think it was twenty eight percent are are uh, have no religious affiliation. Hmm. Not too bad. So unfortunately, that twenty eight percent is not very politically active yeah. because <laughs> the Idaho legislature is eighty percent Republican in both the House and in the Senate. Four to one. So uh, the Democrats are really ignored in most of the legislature, and the Republican Party holds their their uh, party caucus and decides how things are going to be, for the most part. Only a few bills require Democrats to t- cast tie-breaking votes. Yeah. That so. sounds painful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And if if you if you ever throw the words uh, religious freedom into anything around Idaho, um, well, that's definitely going to sway the vote one way or the other. And we will be getting to those stories here in just a little bit. Uh, before we get to that, though, uh, I was on the Zach Religion Cast uh, episode seven uh, last week, and uh, have a link in the show notes where you can go check that out and. Hear my story, uh, a little over an hour of talking about me, uh, wow. which, which uh, yeah, I haven't gone into that much detail on, on my own story on our podcast. So You must not have liked me. I only got like a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave oh, him no. the, I think about the 40 minute version, because uh, telling my story, I've got roughly the like 10 minute short version, like 10, 20, 40 and hour and a half uh yeah yeah so we got the short one there 
All right. And also, uh, Dr. Robin Allen uh, from uh, Boise State University. She's in the social work department. Um, she's doing a sociological survey on atheists and other nonbelievers and their relationships. Uh, this is a, a officially supported uh, research project through Boise State University. And uh, she's looking for as many people from around the country and around the world to contribute. Awesome. And have the link in the show notes for that as well. And we will be reminding you at the end to go and do the survey. Uh, it took me about 10 minutes. At the most, it takes uh, 15. So it's it's well worth it. Uh, let's get that data out there so that uh, we, we've got more saying that we're, you know, good, decent human beings, if that was still in doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh wesley what do you have for us in uh all wow. right so wesley what uh, do you have for us in this day in history all right so first of all this is the idaho edition and apparently uh this is me speaking idaho has shit history so it's a day off <laughs> uh this is actually gonna be for march 4th whereas we're actually releasing on march 5th so sorry yeah <laughs> 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 all right so this day in history 1863, March 4th, uh, the formation of the Idaho Territory. So, uh, yeah, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Congressional Act to create create the Territory of Idaho on March 4th, 1863. Idaho was made into a state seven years later on July 3rd, 1890. Going back a little bit, uh, the territory originally carried most of present-day states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, but later got hacked into a few pieces that we recognize now. Uh, the capital of Idaho territory was Lewiston for a total of three years, but moved to Boise. I grew Boise, up Boise. in Lewiston, and mm-hmm. that is a sore subject with us <laughs> in the former state capital. Oh, wow, for a, a total of three years, and that's still a, a touchy subject. Wow. <laughs> I, I Actually, uh, this next line might give you a chuckle here. Uh, the Territorial Supreme Court voted in 1866 by a margin of one vote to make it Boise. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ooh. Well, yeah. it was um, contentious once upon a time. People just laugh about it now, but we remember. <laughs> 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 well, back then, the, the bulk of the population in the state would have been centered further north, closer to uh, Walla Walla and the Palouse Gold Rush. Hmm. Yeah, I th- I think it was later that... I- Gold was discovered oh, in yeah. Idaho City that yeah. brought people to the south. But. Yeah, that was like the late 1860s, 18, uh, 1870s, I think. Mm-hmm. For a long time, Idaho was also the uh, biggest uh, mi- mining place of uh, lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, gold and, well, not, not of gold, but of lead. But uh, gold, silver, and quite a few other precious metals and gems have been found in Idaho. Yeah, and people uh, always think of Idaho and, and think of potatoes. Yeah, but uh, it's but, called the gem state, isn't it? Yes, it is. And there's a substantial <laughs> amount of mining that still goes on in Idaho today. Nice. Uh, an interesting side note, and perhaps a reason we're having this Idaho theme show today. In the late 1860s, Idaho Territory became a destination for displaced Southern Democrats who fought for the Confederate States of America during the Civil War, a.k.a. the slaveholder bad guy peoples. Yeah. Anyways, uh, these people were well represented at in the early territory legislatures, which often clashed with the appointed, then liberal, Republican territorial governors. The political infighting became particularly vicious in 1867 when Governor David W. Ballard asked for protection from federal troops stationed at Fort Boise against the territorial legislature. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, one, you, you got, like, a lot of people from the, the Civil War coming over here to, you know, get the hell out of dodge really because whatever their reasons were that may uh, explain a lot about today's political news but yeah a few years later there's even more excitement regarding the governor but we'll let you continue <laughs> oh no that's really all i have um it it's mostly just uh territories changing you know map borders changing after that um please tell me if you have some ballard information that'd be fun well, I'm afraid I don't have Ballard information, All right. and I I didn't research this to come on the show, but from my general knowledge of Idaho history, it was either 1900 or 1904, the election for governor um, 
we elected, what was his first name? Something Stunenberg. And he was the first Jewish person elected a governor of a state in the United States. So, hooray for Idaho. Hmm. We were first in something approaching diversity. Wow. And breaking the, the patterns. But unfortunately, later, and I'm not sure if it was when he was out of office again, he died in an assassination. So, oh. uh, somebody planted dynamite by his front gate, and when he opened it, it blew up, and he was killed. Wow. I, I don't know the year just offhand, but I'm sure you can Google it and find out. That's some blazing saddles level of stuff right there. Yeah, and I, the, the motivation for the assassination had nothing to do with religion, if I remember correctly. It was probably over somebody's property being taken or cattle wrestling issues or something like that. I, I don't know. Like I say, I should have. Wow, I needed to be warned crazy. to be prepared on that. <laughs> I know a little bit. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's go ahead and move on to science and technology. And before we share these recent stories, uh, when you narrow down your search on recent science news to a single state, um, you don't <laughs> have a whole lot to look at. So I don't want everyone to think that there is no good science that happens in Idaho. There is some. We are, after all, home of Micron, Simplot, and the Idaho National Laboratory. Um, INL. Micron's still in business? Yes, they so, are, and oh, doing oh, very sweet. well. Yeah, you should have bought stock two years ago. <laughs> uh, if you have crucial memory in any of your computers, uh, that's Micron, produced uh, here in Boise. Sweet. Uh, and uh, INL produces, uh, among their more famous and, and sexy items, is the nuclear power plants for the U.S. space program. So, like, Curiosity is roving around Mars right now with a engine that came out of Idaho. And Boise is home to the Hewlett-Packard LaserJet printer. Mm. Marketing and engineering is done in Boise for the most part. Uh, manufacturing, of course, is at Canon in Japan. And Boise State University is home to um, um, the lady from McCall Morgan, I forget her first name, um, who was the astronaut, who was mm. the teacher in space. She was the backup astronaut to K Krista McAuliffe, who, of course, was killed in the Challenger explosion. And then that program got put on ice for a couple decades. But then they brought um, Mrs. Morgan. Oh, it bugs me that I can't remember her first name offhand. But she's often in the news here, involved in science programs and so on at Boise State University. So she was the she was uh, finally brought into the astronaut corps. Uh, Barbara Morgan, of course. Uh, she was brought into the astronaut corps as a full-fledged uh, mission payload specialist, so she had other work to do as well as being the teacher in space on the shuttle uh, mission uh, a few years ago now and um, came back and retired from NASA and now is at uh, Boise State University. Very nice. And as far as mining in Idaho... Uh, there is a lot of mining in the northern part of the state, and the University of Idaho in Moscow is actually noted for its mining programs. Hmm. Um, I very well respected. Actually, uh, I believe there's an actual mining college up there, isn't there? Uh, uh, well, or at least a technical it's part of the University of Idaho in Moscow cool. School of Mines. Yeah, uh, my shipyard hires people out of there occasionally. Mm -hmm. Guess they make, guess they make good engineers. Yep. All right. Let's All right. go ahead and move into some of this this uh, current science. Um, there is a professor at the College of Idaho. We're, we're talking a small little school in Caldwell. Uh, her name is uh, Carolyn Dadaby. Uh, she's an associate professor of chemistry at uh, College of Idaho, and she's had a a recent hypothesis of trying to find medical treatments in sagebrush. Uh, we have sagebrush all over around here. The entire southern portion of the state is covered in it. And 
uh, she's noticed watching animals interacting with the sagebrush that there are many, many different species that survive on it, even though sagebrush has spent millions of years developing uh, toxins to keep animals from eating them. And <laughs> But each animal knows a certain uh, part of the plant that they can eat and focus just on that. Um, so she's been going out in her free time uh, with some of her undergrad students to uh, collect wide varieties of sagebrush. Uh, one of the, the big reasons to try to do that kind of research here is we have more genetic diversity in the sagebrush here than you would find anywhere else. And so collect a wide variety of sagebrush, and then they process it down. Uh, they uh, dissolve it in, in solvents and then evaporate off the, the solvent and are trying to find uh, uses for these. Her biggest hope is to be able to use it as a additive to cancer treatments. Um, one of the, the difficulties with that is uh, chemotherapy is highly toxic, and the body tries to flush it from your system as quickly as it can. That uh, decreases, uh, decreases the benefit of it. The idea, at least, that sagebrush probably has developed ways of trying to make the toxins in the plant uh, last in the system of the animals that eat them longer. So she's trying to find a way to basically trick the body into hanging on to the chemo longer. There's also some hope with this of being able to try to find some new antibiotic uh, substances as well. Uh, there, there's nothing concrete that's come out yet, um, but there are some promising leads. Uh, enough so that she has gotten a $764,000 grant uh, from the Idaho Institutional Development Award Network for Biomedical Research Excellence. Uh, this is money that's uh, coming from the uh, National Institutes of Health. Well, I don't think they would be giving her a, a, that large of a grant if they didn't see anything promising there. So No, no awesome. they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty cool to see research like this. This has... Again, it's at very early stages, but this has the potential for, uh, you know, brand new territory. And for this to be coming out of a associate professor at a undergrad four year teaching college in Podunk, Caldwell, Idaho, that's that's pretty awesome. I pretty do awesome. like the, the little end, ending bit on this article, though. Please don't eat the sagebrush. And so that's going to all you <laughs> weird nature loving people, hippies and such. Don't eat the sagebrush. Yeah. And she's uh, also said that, uh, you know, if, if she can find the right chemicals, uh, she could uh, be opening up the Idaho desert for cost-effective drugs. And uh, quoting directly from her, it will be a new way of doing drug discovery. Awesome. And there is a young girl in Idaho, uh, 14 years old, uh, Illa Hickman, who for a fifth year in a row has been pushing for the Idaho giant salamander to be recognized as the official uh, state amphibian. Four years in a row, she has failed to get congressional, or excuse me, five years in a row, she has failed to get congressional oh, support. And this year, she actually got the bill. It was House Bill 1. Got it into the, the, the legislature and the uh, House State Affairs Committee um, voted it down. 10 to 6. That's nearly Aww. party lines. Oh, come on. And the reason I mean, why? They were afraid of federal overreach. How? <laughs> Your guess is as good as anybody else's. My understanding yeah. is that the theory was that if it gets designated as the official state bur uh, amphibian, that the federal government might try to help protect this amphibian. Does it need protecting? Is it? No. All right, then they're, they're doing idiots. just fine. They <laughs> they live almost exclusively in northern Idaho. There are some in southern Idaho and a few elsewhere, um, but nearly all of them are somewhere in the state of Idaho. One was recently found uh, in Boise, or or at least in the Boise River. Uh, hmm. But no, they're not in threat. Uh, this crazy salamander can grow to a foot long. Yeah, <laughs> holy crud. Oh, my goodness. Now, I would imagine where you would need to go to find these uh, more readily would be the Frank Church Wilderness. Uh, massive, massive uh, wilderness area. And actually, the full name is even better. Frank Church 
River of No Return Wilderness. Oh, I like that name. It is massive, massive chunk of like the middle of Idaho. And there's not a single road in there. <laughs> there are wolves, and I am sure there are giant salamanders there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. And before we move into the meat of the discussion, uh, politics and religion, um, we do have a quick word from the Coronify Me podcast. Uh, hi. Mm, my name is Al. Uh, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Not anything that starts with an A. I, I promise. I, I misunderstood what you were asking for. Anyways, uh, the Islamic God is like totally omnipotent and stuff, and he wanted me to let you know that he really hopes that if you were one of the early listeners to Coronify Me, that you head back over to the podcast and give it a second chance if you've gone away. In his omniscience, Allah, I mean, uh, I mean, that really cool deity realized the one true podcast didn't get off to the best of starts. Well, after burning a few writers in the hellfires and hiring a completely new staff filled with unquestioning slaves, he relaunched a show filled with skits, comical segments, and even dirty atheist rants that have nothing to do with Islam. Instead of just reading and critiquing that glorious, uh, um, horrible holy book all those brown people read. Uh, if you haven't checked out the show, he orders... <laughs> asked you to give Mr. Q another chance as he finally has seen the promise of the dean and embraced the fold. And again, uh, if you do not... Uh, for my sake, Allah, will you please turn off your computer and come back to bed already? No one gives a shit about what you have to say. Mm, damn it, Jesus, what did I tell you about background noise? You know I don't know how to edit that out, and Gabriel still hasn't come back from Momo's house to show me how. I'm spending a lot of time over there now that I think about it. Come here, you tiger. Uh, uh, and stuff. Uh, thanks, Big Al, and thank your sidekick, Little J, for me, if you'd be so kind. Wow, folks, if that teaser interested you, and if you'd like to learn more about Muslim cultures and the absolutely horrible Islamic faith, and why the Ben Afflecks and C.G. Romans of the world are actually as moronic as they portray themselves in public to be, check out my show. Long gone are episodes filled with reading the Quran. Instead, the show has evolved into an edutaining variety show of all things Islam with none of the lies. Well, plus rants and, and, and parody songs. Uh, oh, and, and pot shots at Christians, too. <laughs> yeah, and awkwardly erotic skits. Yeah, I can't forget those. Check me out on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, and YouTube by searching for Quranify Me. That's Q-U-R-A-N-I-F-Y space M-E. Or you can find everything your heart desires at www.quranifyme.com. Peace. And now it's time for politics and religion. Uh, first off, we've got a fun story that's very fresh. Uh, today, the, the day we're recording is, is Tuesday, March 3rd. Uh, Rajan Zed was the, the guest chaplain for the Idaho State Senate. He's from uh, Nevada and had been invited to come up and give a Hindu uh, invocation. Uh, this, this, uh, prayer was rather lengthy and it was given in both English and Sanskrit with oh. a focus on selflessness and peace. Uh, I, I think those are things that everybody can, you know, get behind. Senators from both sides, uh, shook his hand and thanked mm -hmm. him. Uh, he even said, uh, fulfill all your duties. Action is better than inaction. Even to maintain your body, you're obligated to act. Selfish action imprisons the world. Act selflessly without any thought of personal profit. Three senators uh, left and waited till he was done before they came back. Go figure. They're they're all Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, State Senators Steve Vick of Dalton Garden and uh, 
Yes, Tom and Cecil, D- Dalton Garden is a city, not just some thing in Idaho. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl Nuxel of Cottonwood and Lori Den Hartog of Meridian. Uh, Nuxel said that she declined because she believes the U.S. is a Christian nation. Of course. Uh, Hindu is a false faith with false gods. I think it's great that Hindu people can practice their religion, but since we're the Senate, we're setting an example of we what we Idaho believe. And she wished that they had just that they conducted a Christian prayer along with the Hindu one. And uh, Vic made the news earlier, uh, the day before, with some fun statements he uh, he made about it. <laughs> yep, that that was pretty amazing. It was hitting the uh, blogosphere yesterday afternoon, and uh, that's what alerted me to it. And then this morning, the Idaho Statesman had an article. So this morning, I dashed off an email, and I have all 105 <laughs> legislators, 70 representatives, and 35 senators in my Outlook uh, address book, and I cc'd the governor. And I wrote this. Dear legislator, I do not want government running religion, and I do not want religion running government. Keep church and state separate. Recent court decisions are very clear that invocations or prayers that are part of government meetings must be open to all religions as well as irreligion. That is, invocations must also be permitted from secular humanists and atheists who hold an explicitly non-religious worldview. The proper neutral position is to hold no prayers at all. And in boldface, I continued, Idaho Senator Steve Vick is completely un-American, and then back to regular font, (laughs) it's un-American to hold that daily prayers in the Idaho Senate should favor some religious viewpoints over others, as reported in the Idaho Statesman today. And then in the email, I embedded a link to the statesman story that has the headline, Hindu Hindu Prayer Draws Fire from North Idaho Senator. Then my email continued, Apparently, Senator Vick is representing the minority in his home district who tried, unsuccessfully, to get Idaho declared a Christian state, as also reported recently in the Idaho Statesman. And then I have a link to uh, an article from a few days ago. Uh, North Idaho Committee Rejects Christian State Resolution. And I'll just do a little aside here. The The big news of last week was the uh, Republican Central Committee in Kootenai County, Idaho, which is North Idaho, where Dalton Gardens is. Uh, they had a group of people in that Central Committee try to... Uh, get support for a resolution proclaiming Idaho to be a Christian state. Fortunately, it got voted down by about two to one. Yeah. So, in other words, a third of the Republican Central Committee in Kootenai County, Idaho, wants it to be a an officially Christian state. Anyway, back to my email. I continued on. There is a troubling trend to rewrite American history away from being a nation with a secular government and with complete freedom of and from religion, and two, being a nation with an officially Christian government. Below are some references to useful information. Uh, Liars for Jesus. That's the title of a book by uh, the author Chris Rada, debunking many of the so-called Christian nation claims put forth by David Barton and others. And then I have the the link. It's real easy, www.liarsforjesus.com. And uh, then another paragraph I write here, David Barton Lies About Chris Rada, Part 1, with a link to a YouTube video. And then my email to the legislators concludes, Please do all you can to preserve complete freedom of and from religion in our great state and nation. Sincerely, Paul Rowling. Blah, blah, blah. So that was my input today, and I can tell you that I've already received two 
emails back from state legislators uh, thanking me for sending this and indicating they agree with me. Oh, very nice. I mean, not that they are (laughs) non-religious, but they are appalled at their colleagues' behavior. Yeah. Uh, When when Steve Vick started spouting off, um, he pointed out that they have a caste system. They worship cows. He acknowledged the First Amendment allows any kind of prayer, but thinks a Hindu one shouldn't be allowed because the U.S. was, and I quote, built on the Judeo-Christian, not only on the religion, but work ethic, and I don't want to see that undermined. Right, because Christians are, of course, the only people who know how to work hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing stuff. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next story. Uh, this one is from yesterday, uh, or Monday, so a couple days ago, uh, now. Uh, 23 activists, uh, went to the Idaho State Capitol and they went into the House Gallery and blocked access to the State Senate. Uh, these activists have had the words Idaho shirts and were holding their hands over their, their mouths. Um, they're part of the Add the Four Words campaign trying to get uh, gender identity and sexual orientation added to the Idaho Civil Rights Act, you know, to make it so that discrimination isn't allowed against those groups. Well, th- that bill, they, they, they finally got it to a committee hearing this year. Uh, it was voted down along party lines in the State Affairs Committee in the Idaho House. Um, we will be hearing more about the State Affairs Committee as we keep going. Um, they are, are just doing a, a real bang-up job of being assholes, it really seems. <laughs> um, anyway, these, these protesters, they, they went and uh, they said that they wouldn't uh, leave until they got a hearing. And uh, they were arrested again. <sighs> Two of them were juveniles and were cited and released. Uh, one protester was in a wheelchair. She was also cited and released. And the rest were taken to the jail and released later on uh, $300 bail. Yeah, they all got charged with a misdemeanor trip, trespass. Seriously? Come on. All right. Yeah, I know last year one of the protesters with them uh, was a former state senator. Really? And her, so herself a lesbian. Nicole hmm. a favor. Yep. And... Uh, they actually had a vote in the state Senate to suspend the rules that gave her free access to the Senate floor uh, so they could have her hauled off. <laughs> no special rights for homosexuals. So she was a sitting so member they made at a the special time. Uh, no, no, she was already a former, former member, but most legislative bodies, former members have uh, full access, which is why former members of Congress... Um, U- U.S. Congress have an easy time getting high-paying lobbying jobs. Mm-hmm. So Nicole Favor was elected from uh, Idaho District 17 as a state representative a number of years ago. She had the distinction of being the first openly gay member of the Idaho legislature. All right, so the next story, uh, actually I saw it on uh, Friendly Atheist uh, today, the... Uh, Ada County Highway District uh, last week um, approved three to two to institute a new policy on uh, prayer. Uh, one thing that was nice was uh, Paul and I both received a heads up on this uh, through the, the TV Corps um, contact links. And uh, so I, I shot off a, a, a uh, response to them. I, I wasn't going to be able to attend myself. Was very happy that that Paul could go and and represent us. The director of the Ada County Highway District actually emailed me back. I sent off my email about nine o'clock p.m. He emailed me back at eight thirty in the morning. Oh, not not bad. Asking me to come and testify, and I, I was very disappointed that I already had a prior engagement. But Paul went, and Paul, how did that go? Well, it's interesting. I mean, we know the outcome now. So <laughs> at the very end, it was a downer. Three to two, we lost. But I was riding high until near the very end. Oddly enough, it looked like the vote could go four to one against it. So 
to be clear, the the resolution was to institute having an invocation or prayer to begin the the Ada County Highway District Board meetings. They already do a pledge of allegiance to the flag. For some odd reason, for 40 years, they've been able to get by okay without doing a prayer. But one of the most recently elected directors thought, well, it would be good to have a prayer or an invocation to bring people together and get them ready for the business that would be coming up in the meeting. Now, mind you, typical items of business are whether or not to take away somebody's property to build a road across it, or, um, you know, how to route um, a road here or there, what have you. So sometimes they're pretty contentious. It's a, what, almost six-page resolution with a whole bunch of whereases where they cite a count, bunch of the court cases, including town of Greece versus Galloway, where the United States Supreme Court said, hey, pray away, sort of. <laughs> um, and anyway, they decided this would be a good idea. And so I got heads up a couple days ahead, and guess what? I went and testified. <laughs> so nice. hang on to your hats. You're about to hear me read again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually went into the meeting with two different versions. If they were going to be really sticky on time, I had one that I could almost finish in three minutes. But I, they were not being sticky about time, so I read the five-and-a-half-minute one. And also, their, their official policy is that if you are representing a group, you get more time. Oh, oh nice. So, so, Ada County Highway District. Mr. President and Commissioners, good evening. My name is Paul Rolig, and you have to give your actual street address. Uh, I live in West Boise. I am a media contact for the Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason. TV Corps represents non-religious voters and sponsors advertising campaigns to let non-religious people know that they are not alone. Well, hallelujah. This resolution is truly a revelation to me. I've always wondered why our roads have so many ungodly potholes in them. Now I know why. We just haven't been invoking the deities enough. Seriously, do you not have enough highway work to keep you busy that you have to wade into one of the most controversial issues of our time? Yes, as the resolution calls out, court cases have set the precedent that, under certain strict conditions, Government meetings opening with invocations might not be in violation of the United States Constitution. Now, ask yourselves this. Why have there been so many court cases on this subject? Do you think it might be because Americans are so divided around religion? And are you sure your resolution passes constitutional muster? I do not believe it does. Paragraph 4A provides that invocation speakers will be selected from among assemblies, and I quote here from the resolution, that regularly meet for the primary purpose of sharing a religious perspective. Unquote. As a secular humanist, I find this very demeaning to those of us who embrace an explicitly non-religious view of the universe. We see it being governed by natural forces, not supernatural forces. Your legal counsel should not have to look very far at all to find cases in which courts have ruled that such invocations must also be open to non-religious points of view. If your legal counsel does not recognize this, I can have the legal counsel of several national groups I belong to contact your legal counsel to make this clear. <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> My preference would be for ACHD not to sanction prayers or inv invocations from anyone. But if you proceed with this resolution, I will insist on there being non-religious leaders included in the list of people to give invocations. The resolution tries to make it sound as though these invocations will be open to many diverse points of view but we know that it is the most fervent evangelical preachers who will make sure they are on your list. I imagine many religious leaders, especially those with smaller congregations, are busy enough tending to their members and will not make it a priority to come and open ACHD meetings. 
Do you think it is plausible, with so much anti-Muslim sentiment being expressed so openly these days, that if a Muslim leader were to come and give the invocation, that anti-Muslim folks would come and scream at them and you, that you are bringing Sharia law to ACHD? You and I know that such a charge would be ridiculous, but from what I see posted on Facebook and snippets from Fox News, many Americans believe exactly that. I have a personal friend and professional colleague who is Muslim, and he has confided in me that many in Boise's Islamic community feel as though they have targets on their backs. How likely is it that a Muslim leader will want to come here and open themselves to some such challenges? Proponents of this resolution doubtless claim they need these invocations as part of their freedom of religion. This is nonsense. Religious people can attend any assembly they like right now, go down the street proclaiming their faith, and go door-to-door -door admonishing their neighbors to give up their false religions and join the one true religion. No one needs to come to ACHD meetings to get that dose of religion they just cannot find anywhere else. Anyone who does come to these meetings, who does want to pray, may certainly take a seat a moment before the meeting begins and pray to whichever deities they like. Proponents of this resolution might also claim that by not having any prayers, ACHD is favoring the secular point of view. This is not the case. In order to be favoring the secular point of view, you would have to begin every meeting with non-religious people giving invocations explicitly dismissing religion. No prayers at all. That's the neutral position. Finally, the resolution says there will be no fiscal impact. This is disingenuous. You have already paid legal counsel to research a bunch of precedents and draft this resolution. Then your staff will have to spend time administering the list and publishing metrics showing a truly representative selection of speakers. There may be more legal costs as objections are raised from various members of the ACHD community. I really do not understand why you would want to open this Pandora's box. Please vote no on this resolution. Oh, and I was just kidding about the potholes. I really do think ACHD does a terrific job maintaining our streets and roads. Thank you. But the question is, how are how is the pothole situation? Oh, it is honestly quite good. I, I think yeah. the roads are in good condition. Yeah, we do have... I mean, everybody gripes when there's road construction, but the construction is to make the roads better. Yeah, the, the, the local adage is that there's there's three seasons. There's... Uh, winter, spring, and road construction. Well, uh, Idaho not being a, a uh, coastal state, uh, a destination state, I might say, um, do, does Idaho have 24-hour road, road crews on their highways? Uh, generally, especially in the winter when there's snow. I mean, they start pawing the roads in the middle of the night if that's when the snow comes. Yeah. But most of the construction is just at night. Well, yeah, the c construction, because I... I I remember Wyoming, Colorado, all those, you would have road crews, it didn't matter what time of day, if there was work, they did it, just to get it over and done with and get at, the truckers at going. At least in Ada County, they, well, the Treasure oh. Valley, they, they stick to nighttime to not interfere with commutes. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. Yeah, if, if they're working in residential areas, though, I think they work in the daytime, so yeah. as not to keep people awake at night, but. Washington is like office hours, daytime only. <laughs> it's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that's interesting is with the, the media reporting on this, uh, they, they quoted uh, some of the commissioners. Uh, one of them was Rebecca Arnold, who said, I am a Christian and I pray every day. I thank God I live in the United States of America, where I am free to do that or not, where I am free to choose when, where, and how to pray and with whom. This resolution takes away our freedom because it forces our employees to sit through religious rituals when they may or may not wish to. This was opposed by, openly opposed by the director of the uh, highway district, Bruce Wong, who had asked me to come and, and testify after I emailed. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a number of other employees that spoke out against it, who even though they pray, they don't want to have to sit through prayers when they're required as part of their job to go to these meetings and i doubt none of those good good honest christian folk would like to sit through a muslim or a hindu prayer 
Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, the dynamics of the meeting was very interesting. The the uh, invocation or prayer or resolution was the fifth item on the agenda. So we were like two and a half hours into the meeting before we got around to it. They uh, had the legal counsel introduce the resolution, um, giving his you know explanation of what it was, what it was about. Of course, the commissioners would have been studying it for some time, and I'm, they they have had discussions prior to this, and apparently just wasn't made very public. So um, it may not have been hidden, but nobody was going and looking at the minutes to see if there was something like this. So I think the commissioners already knew where the other one stood on the issue, and you know, political science 101 says probably wouldn't have made it to a hearing if they weren't pretty sure they had a majority to pass it, right? So that's the assumption I went to the meeting under. So the legal counsel finished his presentation. That took about 10 minutes. And then they called for public input. And my name was the first one. I was the first one to assign in on the list. And so I was called first, gave the speech that I just read. In this hearing, you're much closer to the members of the board than at the state legislature. And I was looking at the faces, and I could see some definite smiles and nods of approval and some definite scowls and <laughs> uh, rolling of eyes, wondering where this was coming from. Um, but anyway, I said my piece, and they thanked me, and I sat down, and they called the second person on the list to... Uh, I had not known ahead of time that he was going to testify, but it was a, a former member of uh, Humanists of Idaho. So he gave his arguments, also opposing having the invocations. Um, so he spoke for a few minutes, and uh, then the third person they called turned out to be a person who was a, is a supervisor with the Ada County Highway District. And she was a very sweet and earnest woman, and she gave her arguments as to why uh, they should not have invocations at the meetings. Uh, as a supervisor, she explained, she often has to attend meetings, and other employees of ACHD have to attend the hearings as part of their job. And she felt very uncomfortable with the idea of sitting there uh, with workers, uh, co-workers, and people who reported to her, listening to religious viewpoints that they may, might, might or might not agree with. And so there was concern that, well, gee, if people uh, disagreed, what would they do? Would they feel... Uh, Duty bound to stay, or you know, what if they got up and walked out? Would that be held against them in a performance review and things like that? So um, she explained that she never talks about religion with her co-workers, but she shared, at, as the article that Dustin quoted from mentioned, that she is a Christian and she read the Book of Matthew. Um, what is it? Chapter six, verse six, five verse nine. No, er, verse nine. Yeah, five to nine. Five to nine. This is the, bottom, the, the executive summary is: Be not as the hypocrites in praying in public. Go pray in a closet or in private. So she read that and um, thanked the commission. And you really have to admire the courage of someone like that, who is an employee of the district, going before the board of directors that are elected by the people to govern the, the district, uh, arguing against them adopting this policy. It became obvious during her testimony that this was a very emotional issue, and the hearing actually had a recess of about five or ten minutes at that point. Uh, Commissioner Arnold was visibly upset and had to go in a back room and collect herself. You know, as we see from the vote, Rebecca Arnold and Sarah Baker voted against it. Goldthorpe, is it Root? And Hansen voted for it. 
Anyway, they adjourned for a little while, and somebody even had to hunt down an, an inhaler for Rebecca Arnold, and finally she got her her uh, composure back, and the hearing continued. And so then they called the fourth person who had signed up as a member of the public, and that was Gary Mitchell, president of Idaho Atheists. <laughs> so he gave his spiel, um, also opposing it, and being... You know, three out of four members who came identifying them explicitly as non believers. <laughs> and the other one was a Christian, but I'm against this too. I think it really took the commissioners aback. So, I'm sorry, so nobody spoke in favor of this? Nobody from the public came and spoke in favor of it. Okay. So, wow. uh, I was afraid that, you know, whatever commissioner had been pushing it would have had. You know, a million troops there to say, oh, yeah, man, Jesus, we got to have him. But anyway, um, they didn't. So, Well, people push resolutions like this under the assumption that nobody's going to bother caring. Well, that's that's true. I mean, some people have no idea that there's anyone who believes differently from themselves. So anyway, then the commissioners asked uh, the director, uh, Bruce Wong, to step up and give his input. And he um, summarized that he had talked with mm, a large percentage of the employees of the highway district, how they felt about it. And if I remember correctly, he said like 80% of them preferred that if they were going to do this, that it just be a moment of silence and not have an actual prayer or invocation where people would agree or disagree. Uh, And he also informed the uh, commissioners that due to the issues raised uh, and discussions and concerns from the employees, that he would not attend the portion of the meetings where the invocations were given so that employees would not feel as though they were being monitored for presence or uh, displaying sufficient piety or insufficient piety or anything like that. Um, and the the woman I mentioned previously, the supervisor, she had also indicated that she would take herself out of the room during the invocation so that people who reported to her wouldn't feel they were being monitored. And I, I think that really took some of the commissioners aback. Uh, they expected not, you know, so much pushback. So then finally we got around to the discussion amongst the commissioners themselves. You know, the the current president of the commission is um, Jim Hansen, who I, if I remember correctly, is a Democrat, has served in the legislature, and I expected he would be voting against it, but it turned out, no, you know, they do it in the legislature, so why shouldn't we do it here kind of attitude. So uh, that was a surprise to me and a disappointment, frankly. Um, and I didn't know about the uh, the f- fifth commissioner. By this time, it was clear to me that Commissioner Goldthorpe was the one who was really pushing this. Uh, Sarah Baker and Rebecca Arnold both made their positions known, both of them made it clear that they were Christians and they prayed, but they didn't feel this was the place. Uh, Sarah Baker also quoted the Bible. She read the golden rule, do unto others as you would have do unto, as you would have others do unto you. And she looked her fellow commissioners in the eye and said, would you want someone to cause you as much distress as you have caused others tonight? Um, so she made her point. Rebecca Arnold also quoted the Bible, also read the the verses from Matthew about praying in public versus private. And um, you know, Commissioner Goldthorpe said, you know, he looked kind of mystified that, you know, why? Why would anyone be against this? You know, prayer is what brings people together. Where he got that idea, I don't know. But 
uh, his church where it literally uh, brings I everyone guess. together. <laughs> everyone who believes the same comes uh-huh. together and they pray together and it brings them together. Then uh, Jim Hansen, as I mentioned, um, recalled his days in the legislature and that they have prayers and it was no big deal. There wasn't in his day anyway. Uh, and then the other commissioner, Paul Woods, he he was more laid back, and he also did say, notably, that he was fine if atheists and secular humanists and agnostics wanted to come and and give invocations or prayers, that that was fine with him. That, and he said that atheism is a faith, so why not? <laughs> You know, it's open to all faiths. And Gary and and um, David and I in the back were shaking our heads vigorously. <laughs> no, really, you know, secular humanism, atheism is not a faith. Well, at least but, it sounds like he read my email saying, mm-hmm. because I did say that if this does pass, that I will make sure that TV Corps and its member organizations are included and that religious minorities in the area are also included. Mm -hmm. So I've got two things to add to this right real quick. Okay. Uh, The ACHD now has not just one, but two superfluous things before every meeting. Awesome. (laughs) Uh, And two, you guys need to proposition every Muslim, every, every Baha'i, every every Hindu, every group you can think of. The Hare Krishna. Oh, mm-hmm. goodness, yes. Yeah. Yes. There is a Hare get, Krishna temple in town. Get all of them to <laughs> be on that list as soon as possible. <laughs> Just ma- make them eat their words. Last year in the, the parade, we were uh, behind the uh, Hare Krishna. This is the, the 4th of July parade. <laughs> so we're talking two hours of listening to them sing the same song. Over oh, no. and over and over. It took a week for me to get that out of my head. <laughs> I would love for the the Ada County Highway District to have to listen to that song for three oh, minutes. Yeah. yeah, fill up that list <laughs> with all these lovely religious groups before the Christians can sign up. I'm serious, dead serious. <laughs> let, let them have some fun. So the first two items that we talked about, or a couple items that we talked about, the... Uh, uh, deal with the the kerfuffle over the Hindu prayer and the uh, vote in the North Idaho uh, Republican Central Committee meeting about establishing Idaho as an officially Christian state. Um, when those were in the news, I cc'd the uh, Ada County Highway District, so just continuing to remind them, are you Sure, this is going to bring people together. <laughs> uh, jumping in from post-production with a update on this story that we just talked about. Uh, Wednesday, March 4th, at a meeting of the Ada County Highway District, they had a motion from one of the people who had voted in favor of the bill to reconsider it, and he put forth a suggestion of just a statement uh, promoting freedom and tolerance, followed by a moment of silence. Uh, that motion for reconsideration pass four to one and it will be back up on next week's agenda uh hopefully i will have more information for you in two weeks when we have more news for you and now back to the show going back to the idaho state house of representatives uh they approved house bill 154 uh this week um overwhelmingly and this bill uh puts restrictions on chemical abortions um, in particular, it requires a in-person examination and counseling uh, before getting a prescription for RU486. This is in light of the fact that Idaho has two abortion clinics, which means the only place where you can get abortion drugs in Idaho now is Boise. Right. For the entire state. Awesome. Yeah. Am I... Am I- Right in recalling that uh, that the uh, tele doctor visits are shut down now, is is that what this is part of for abortions? Yeah. Uh, when this was in committee, it got some well, just awesome. Uh, Representative Vito Barbieri, after three hours of testimony, 
about this bill, he asked because you know he he was already familiar with being able to swallow a pill um, for a remote uh, colonoscopy, and wanted to know if women could swallow a pill uh, to check on a pregnancy. Right, because I I recall you know many women saying that you know they were just so tired of all those poos that came out of the out of their vagina well actually i had an interesting recollection to uh, my my early childhood in in eastern oregon on the farm about six seven years of age i thought babies came out of the butt <laughs> i had seen cows and goats have sex and give birth and it all looked like it was in the butt <laughs> Oh, there's life in the rectum after all. And what's funny is even the the girls in my class, uh, this is like, like first grade, they thought <laughs> babies came from the butt. There, there was, I remember like six or seven of us on the playground talking about it. We were all convinced. Yep, it was the butt. These so, are not the conversations I had on the playground. <laughs> so Barbary, there's a chance that, that maybe he's never actually... Uh, been with a woman and his only contact and, and interaction with sex involves watching farm animals do it. Right. Uh, he, so he has never actually had sex vaginally with his wife. Uh, he he is married. He claimed later it was a rhetorical question, but he made his point. Uh, made the point that he's a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, yeah, that, that was during an, the uh, testimony of a, uh, a, a, a gynecological doctor mm-hmm. yes and who was by the way a, you know uh for this uh these restrictions <sighs> and that bill uh passed 55 to 14 and is headed on to the state senate um i think it is worth noting that we aren't meaning to just be beating up on republicans <laughs> however in idaho uh that's the government. It is. It's basically a one-party state. And one thing I noticed when I moved from the Seattle area uh, to Boise and voted in my first election is that the Repub- the Democrats here looked like the Republicans in in Washington. Oh my! And the Republicans looked like the Libertarians, or worse. <laughs> and the Libertarians looked well, just completely insane. <laughs> so <laughs> our spectrum is really far right as it is <laughs> most democrats here would be republicans in most other states in all practicality <laughs> yeah certainly any, anyone who's a moderate republican here could be a you know conservative democrat somewhere else yeah <laughs> yeah and and none of these are things i see as necessarily partisan issues it's issues of church versus state and fundamental human rights and uh, where the local politicians come down mm-hmm. on them is is um, what you see yeah each and every one of these is a, a issue of atheism and humanism mm-hmm. pure and simple uh which brings us to a fun one uh, Idaho has also passed House Bill 113, which has been mentioned. Uh, this was passed almost along party lines, even though eight Republicans joined with the minute Democrat minority um, to oppose it. So it passed with a uh, 37 to 31 margin. And it's it's been called the Parents' Rights Bill. Hmm. Uh, it, it gives parents fundamental rights. Uh So I also prepared testimony against this bill and attended the hearing. And while I was sitting listening to the testimony, um, I got educated in some legal terminology. It turns out two of the first people called to testify were attorneys. Um, One was from... Uh, representing some Idaho Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. And um, she argued that this bill is really introducing some new twists in Idaho law, and it was going to conflict with other parts of Idaho law. And the uh, Prosecuting Attorneys Association really felt it shouldn't be passed, or at least um, that they should 
uh, remove legal guardians as part of the terminology and education from the list. Because to, so, to explain a little bit there, it, it grants fundamental rights to all parents and legal guardians over child's care, welfare, and uh, Care, education. custody, education, and control of their children. Yeah. So it turns out that um, um, the basics of what they're saying here is not new at all, that state courts and federal courts have consistently upheld that parents have fundamental rights over the care, custody, and control of their children. It turns out fundamental is a technical term, and it means a right that is guaranteed in the Constitution. Um, what the exact distinction is between absolute rights and ordinary rights compared with fundamental rights I couldn't tell you, but a competent attorney could. And those are legal terms. So, <clears throat> basically, um, I'll summarize a little bit here. The, the next person to testify was a staff attorney from the Idaho Supreme Court. It wasn't a justice from the Supreme Court, but one of the attorneys who works in their staff. He had the same point, that you really shouldn't put legal guardians in this place, and you really shouldn't put education in this place in the law, because those are dealt with other places. Um, so the, f the proponents of the law argue that, yeah, we need to write this into the law, because while it is upheld by courts at the moment, courts might change their mind and take them away from us, and we want it written into the law. And... <laughs> So my remark earlier referencing this uh, in one of my other communications was, oh, okay, fair enough. However, it turns out the way this is phrased, parents and legal guardians who have legal custody of minor children have a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the care, custody, education, and control of their children. So the proponents say we need to put it in the law. And... They didn't bring this up. It's the opponents who brought it up. It turns out putting legal guardians in there, in addition to parents, is going to be problematic because legal guardianship is something that can be kind of transitory. If mm -hmm. parents are away for a little while, does that give someone who has temporary custody complete uh, fundamental right to make decisions concerning the care, custody, education, and control of the yeah. children? Uh, it sounds like it. Sounds like you could have two groups fighting over one child. That's, the parents and the legal guardians. Well, yeah. uh, not a every of, parent has legal guardianship of their chi child all the time. A couple of attorneys agree with you on that. Yeah. And, and putting foster parents in charge of a child's education. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, pretty crazy. That's a problem. And then putting education in here, it turns out, Education has dealt with a lot of other places in the law, and this is raising concerns now that this means uh, a parent has the fundamental right to come in and object to any little ticky-tack thing in a school and claim it's their fundamental right to have their child taught differently. Um, so, like, so. sex ed, evolution? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot oh. of these things parents already have control over now. I mean... In the Meridian School District, for example, where my kids went to school, they have sex education, but it's um, it's at three levels, and you need parental permission for the top two levels. So the three levels mm -hmm. in what used to be called the Meridian School District, now the West Ada School District, are a little bit of information. That's the top level. Hardly any information. That's the next level down. <laughs> And then the bare minimum required by state law, uh, which is the bottom level, and that is kids have to be told that you can get AIDS by having sex and that there's no cure for AIDS. So state law requires they have some awareness of AIDS. But there's nothing approaching comprehensive sex education, and you already have to sign a parental permission list to get into the middle or upper so, level. to even remotely start getting into basic biology and physiology of it, 
requires parental consent? The most basic biology, I, I can't say. You'd yeah. have to talk to an educator who's current. But, yeah, wow. it's uh, depressingly little information given in the schools. You so, should just call the bottom rung the Adam and Eve level. Just get it over with. <laughs> so anyway, um, now that the bill is in front of the Senate, um, I see more and more articles about education groups taking stands and stuff. So, um, Oh, one of the most awesome objections that came out of the, the state legislature, uh, or out of the state house, was that it could bring in Sharia. Yeah. That this conceivably could allow a parent to require that the education follow Sharia standards. Uh, this thing, that totally gets me. I mean, I saw this... that in a headline on something on the web, and I read the article that was under it, and I saw no further reference to that. Uh, State Representative Deed. Oh, Reed McDormand. Uh, yeah, yeah, Reed McDormand, uh, Republican of Eagle, the House Education Chairman, who strongly supports school choice, said the bill could allow parents to demand their child be taught in public school to follow Sharia law or demand Spanish-only classes. This right here is should be the Republican nightmare. I mean, this is the start of the no-go zone yeah. that the nutters worry oh, about. Oh, here's the next part that, that he uh, brought up. Every parent could then say they want their own specific textbook for their own child. I don't sure. know what the cost of this is going to be. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are some of the reactions. That's a, re- a Republican, mind you, raising that uh, objection. So good for him for understanding what thinking. might happen with this bill. Um, so the proponents say we need this because the government schools are taking our kids away from us. And a couple pretty s- sober, serious legal um, authorities are saying, now, hold on here. This is going to mess up Idaho state law. And uh, then the people like Linda Martin, who are against the child sacrifice that's currently legal under Idaho law, are concerned that this is going to give um, Idaho parents the right to ignore any law for anything, not just medical care. Mm-hmm. So there's that concern also. Yeah. It's it's alarming. Uh, it's it's scary, and I hope that the state senate ignores it. Uh, there there is we can hope. There there's a pretty good precedence here for the state house to pass all kinds of insanity, and for it to all just die in the senate. That's true. I, I'm kind of curious. Does anything useful ever get passed in the Idaho in the Idaho government? <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. Uh, on on occasion, uh, yeah, wow. on occasion. Do you think they're just like uh, backloading all this crazy stuff at the end of the session? They're just trying to shove it through real quick. Uh, no, they're not at the end of the session yet. Uh, yeah, we're still in the first half. Oh no, uh, they won't be doing that until April. Mm. April's when they start just axing stuff uh, because it's it's getting too uh, too out there. Uh, or or they're, they're running out of time and they have budgets they have to pass so they can go back to their farms and their legal practices. Mm, mm, mm. And uh, Linda Martin's been keeping this, uh, the, the faith healing uh, stuff in the, in the media. Uh, one of the most awesome recent articles um, came out of uh, Al Jazeera America. <laughs> and nice. I, speaking we, of Sharia law, yeah, <laughs> since we are running out of, uh, Definitely running out of time. I uh, want to just focus on the last little bit. Uh, Republican Representative Christy Perry of Nampa uh, said the law as it stands represents the constituents in her district. Um, she represents Canyon County, where Peaceful Valley Cemetery and a whole bunch of the followers of Christ are. Uh, she said they have a clear understanding of what the role of the government should be. It isn't to tell me how to live my life. Um, she said that they are more comfortable confronting death, that children do die. And I'm not trying to sound callous, but people calling for reform want to act as if death is an anomaly. It's not. It's a way of life. That woman's a trooper. Death is a way of life. Yeah. That's what we're up against. She also went on to complain about not hearing from, or hearing a whole bunch from people outside of Idaho, but mostly just getting support from people in Idaho. So we're trying to make sure that she hears more from people here. Um, Yeah. Also, we did a, a letter writing campaign to 
uh, the entire, I believe it was the State Affairs Committee. Uh, I got a, a response uh, from one of the ones I sent in from uh, Representative Nate King from Rexburg. And started off good with him being like, wow, I didn't realize this was happening. Uh, thanks for bringing it to my attention. But we must protect parental rights and religious freedom. And I actually replied back, basically laid out, we have to draw the line somewhere. We aren't going to allow somebody to slit a child's throat on an altar, but we do allow someone to allow their child to drown in their own fluids of pneumonia. And it would be more humane to go with the, to just slit the throat. Pretty and much. I think I might have turned him. Mm-hmm. His response on that was very encouraging. Wow. Uh, it's easy when it, there's that fine line when, when dealing with, adversarial people in in government of trying to be polite to the point of being ineffective and there are times where you need to be blunt and i my basic response and message on this one at least from here on out is going to just simply be it would be more humane to slit a child's throat on an altar than to allow the child drown in from pneumonia mm-hmm it's all right that works. there. <laughs> yeah, it's very blunt, but you're not stooping to name calling. Mm-hmm. You're drawing an analogy, and yeah, uh, hard for me to argue with that analogy. One, the state has decided is not permissible parental rights or religious freedom, and the other, the state has decided is permissible parental rights and religious freedom. And a point that I often bring up in my communications is that. An atheist parent would be charged for child neglect for doing that, and rightly so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No atheist I know would treat their child that way. But So to give religious people the right to do that is giving them a special right, yeah. a special exemption from the law. And I think people should all have to obey the same law. In the interest of time, though, uh, we need to move on to feedback. Uh, we got a message from Michael Goff uh, regarding episode 82. Um, this was on Facebook. Uh, my wife and I just checked our Florida marriage license. Uh, nowhere on it does it mention husband or wife, though it does mention groom and bride. I looked up groom, and it means the head, and bride is the property. So I basically own my <laughs> wife. Anyway, so when Jesus said the church was his bride, what did he really mean? Incidentally, later in the license, it only mentions us as persons. It means that Jesus is telling you to bend over, get get ready for it, Michael. Sorry. Uh, it's it's one of those things when <sighs> states have had to allow same sex marriage. The only thing that has had to change is changing the bride and groom labels to spouse and spouse. That's it. Two words. That's all they have to change. Yeah, they're going to have to throw away maybe a, a couple of hundred copies that they already had underneath the desk, but so what? Toss another ream in the printer and get it over with. If you have if you've got those copies already there, use them up on opposite sex couples. Sure. You already have them. But have the new ones available and then just stick with them once the old ones run out. It, it's not a huge hassle. From uh, regarding episode 83, we got two messages. Uh first one from Todd Mills at in, letter N, God We Trusted, past tense, <laughs> uh, on Twitter, at Atheist Nomads, at YouTube, fun conversation. Uh, he, he saw the episode on, on YouTube. I've, I've started uh, posting, well, encoding the audio with just our, our cover photo and putting that up on YouTube. Thanks for suffering that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And from uh, Answers in Nature via YouTube, I want to say you save the best for last. I have had a lot of pet rodents over the last couple decades, including Daegu's. My current rodent pets are chinchillas, prairie dogs, and hamsters. My non-rodent pets are goats, ferrets, rabbits, and a puppy. I'll be damned. I'd eat most of those. <laughs> <laughs> that is... Wow. That's like quite the... The that miniature quite the collection. petting farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should open that up to little kids. Yeah. <laughs> Charge two bits. Anyway, you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. You can call us at 541-203-0666. 
Uh, you can hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads, YouTube at Atheist Nomads, and you can also uh, hit up our YouTube channel. Just look for Atheist Nomads. And please visit our page and use that nice little Amazon click through because we could sure use the scratch. You won't notice any, uh, any anything on the on your bottom line there, but we'll get a little bit of money for everything you purchase. And you can also uh, always sign up as a patron at patreon.com slash atheist nomads or uh, donate or subscribe on uh, or through PayPal. Uh, go to atheistnomads.com and you'll find all that right there on the right of the page. Yay. And thanks for having me on your show. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us, Paul, and thank you so much for being actively involved. Uh, That's my pleasure. Yeah, we need we need good representatives in the the atheist community, and to uh, all of our listeners, it's just a good reminder to be active with local government. Uh, you can make a difference. You can get your voice heard, and yeah, it might be kind of frustrating because local government is where you tend to get the crazies, um, but it's needed. And that's where you can make a difference. It's also one of those things where it's a lot easier to get elected. Um, some of those seats like highway district and irrigation boards often go with nobody running. Hmm. Uh, you can get in unopposed on some of them. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com.